Hey everybody, Chris here. Today I'm going to talk about pulmonary embolisms. I uh, had a video before where I talked about Xeralto and I gave a review of my uh, my, my review of Xeralto, which is a medication that helps to prevent uh, blood clotting, deep vein thrombosis, which I've had a couple of times in my life. So I gave a product review of that. Uh, I'm quite happy with the product as far as if you can be happy with a medication. I prefer not to take it, but if I have to take it, it's pretty low impact and it's kept me out of trouble over the last few years. But I wanted to talk specifically about why I take it and what led up to me taking it. Uh, in case others may benefit from it, I had never, prior to my first instance with a, a DVT or a deep vein thrombosis, didn't even know what they were, had never heard of them before. And so I was lucky that I had a person at work that had just recently gone through it. And so uh, a DVT blood clot can lead to a pulmonary embolism where the clot actually lodges uh, within the blood passages inside of your lungs, preventing blood flow. Uh, which can be fatal if untreated, undiagnosed. I think I read up to up to 30% fatality rate for those those instances where they're they're not treated or diagnosed. Um, lower rates, not to scare anybody, but much lower rates of fatality if they can be treated. Although they're no joke. Um, so if you if you have a DVT, you definitely want to get some help for it. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own story. So for me, as I said, I, I knew nothing about it. But uh, I went into work one day, and I had, for a couple of days, had had a, a, a pain in the back of my leg, like in the calf. And it felt, I could, the only thing I could use to describe it, it felt like a residual Charlie horse. Not sharp, but just this pain that felt like it was a mild Charlie horse in my calf but would not go away. I could not work it out, right? So I would walk around, I had my wife and my kid massaging it, and it didn't have any impact at all. And so, um, you know, luckily for myself, I don't, I'm not too shy about talking about my own medical conditions with people. So I was chatting with a gal at work and saying, man, I have this pain, and, and I don't, I don't normally get pains like that. And she grew up very serious and she says, you need to call your doctor right now. You could have a blood clot. And I, was, I couldn't believe how quickly the conversation went from me describing what I thought was a Charlie horse to her telling me that I needed to contact my doctor immediately to get a checkup. And so her story had been that she had had her own and she had had her own deep, a deep vein thrombosis issue that had also turned into a pulmonary embolism. And she was somebody who I respected greatly. She was a, a like a, a triathlete type. So for her, she had you know, her instance occurred. She had her her pulmonary embolism knocked her down at the, when she was at the top of a mountain hiking. She had to get medevaced off the top of the mountain. They took her to the hospital, and she had her own procedure, and she survived. Um, but it was a very traumatic event for her. Anytime you have to, you know, extended duration of the hospital is pretty traumatic in my way of thinking. Anyway, she had just had this happen. So she she said, "You need to call your doctor immediately." And I called my doctor. Um, who I didn't really have much of a, I had, didn't go to the doctor very much up to that time, and, but I called the office and they said, well, do, do you, you know, what's going on? Do you, do you have an emergency? And I said, well, I don't know if it's an emergency, but I was talking with a coworker and I think I might have a, a, a blood clot or I think I might have a blood clot in my leg. And the woman on the phone said, can you come in this afternoon? And that's when I had the first inclination that they were pretty serious. And so I made arrangements to get out of work. I found my way to the, the doctor's office. They immediately, um, you know, worked me through some procedures, took some blood, sent me over to an imaging place to get some uh, pictures taken of my leg, and sure enough, I had a blood clot. So they put me on some blood thinners. They immediately put me on, there was a couple of different products. One of, I remember Warfarin, Coumadin, and I don't know if those are the exact same things or not, so I'm not an expert on the, the medication, but they also gave me these injections. And the injections were, they had to self-inject. Uh, I think for about 10 days, I was giving myself injections that was going to uh, very quickly start the blood clot teardown process, whereas the Warfarin would take a little bit of time. So I, I was introduced to giving myself injections, uh, which I don't have a problem with. It was a little weird, but once you I'm not squeamish about needles or blood, so I was able to do that, and uh, and, and pretty quickly the the actually within a day or so the, the pain went away in my leg. Um, I did stay on the Coumadin or the Warfarin, I forget which one they prescribed, but I stayed on that for a couple of months, 
and they did some tests because as it turns out with DVTs, there's a possibility that you could have, that I could have inherited this uh, uh, th from my family line. There are apparently genetic markers for this. So they ran the tests to see if that was the case and that was not the case. So I just got lucky, right? So I just have this predisposition to get blood clots um, and didn't know it until that point. So this one, uh, you know, they, they put me on the medication after a while. They, you know, everything seemed fine, so they took me off. And I didn't really think too much of it. I thought, well, you know, it happens. And they said that it happens. And they said there are things that can happen in your life that can increase the chances of you getting them. You know, long travel on a plane is a common one where you're in a seat, your legs aren't moving, you are at a higher risk of having clots form in your legs. So that's kind of scary because, you know, I, I don't fly a lot, but when I fly, I fly a long way because I live in Alaska. So I was like, oh, that kind of, that's, that's not the best. That kind of sucks. Um, but anyway, that clot period went away fine. And it was a couple years later, I think four or five years ago from this point where um, this time I didn't have any blood pain, but uh, my leg, my left leg started swelling up like a sausage which wasn't weird, right? It wasn't the regular, my socks are cutting off circulation type of swelling. It was big and noticeable, especially compared to my other leg. So I immediately recalled that I had had this DVT incident in my life before. So I contacted the doctor. They sent me over to, this, to the imaging center, got some scans done, and the scans turned out to be inconclusive. So they're like, well, no, we don't see a clot there. We're not quite sure what's going on. And I thought, well, that's odd because now I don't know what it is. And so I went for um, several more weeks where the leg just was swollen. And also I began to felt symptoms that I couldn't really attribute to anything else. Looking back, I did sense that I was, my fatigue, I was beginning to feel more fatigued and my energy levels were dropping off. And in a weird way that it's hard to describe, I could feel like my lips were a little like, I would say, um, turning more raisin-like, where they were, I felt like there was this pressure pulling liquid out of my lips. It's a hard thing to describe, but I could, it's a sensation that I could have. So I remember feeling worn out. I felt like I was, like I wasn't getting blood flow to my lips, like there was this, you know, raisin effect happening. And this was right around Halloween time, and I, I remember I was volunteering at my kid's spooktacular, so that the school we put on a spooktacular event where it's pretty much what you can imagine, a haunted house where you set up these mazes and other events for the kids to play in, and I was in the haunted house getting to scare people. And so I was in a particular place, and I think I was there for about two hours doing my scares, like, rah, and I mean, there's nothing better than getting a dad to scream, right? I mean, that's kind of the, if you can get a dad to scream, you know, you're chalking those things up. So <laughs> that's the measure of your night. But I remember coming out of that night and it took a lot out of me. Um, and so I felt, I felt physically different after that one night. And I, I'm not saying that there's any relationship between what was happening with the blood clot and that, but I do, in the sequence of events, I remember that night being uh, kind of a significant point where I felt much weaker after that. Now, um, so a couple days beyond that, I continued with my regular, my regular schedule. I was, you know, go to work and it, it was on a very, it was, it was in the morning. And so I live about an hour away from where I work and I get on a, or I used to get on a van and I would get on a share van and ride into work with a bunch of group of people. It was pretty nice. I didn't have to drive. And so I was on the van. It was probably seven or so in the morning and I, um, got off the van to walk about a half a block to where my building entrance was. And I remember seeing a coworker that I knew and they were crossing the, the street on the other side and I waved to say hi to them. And as soon as my arm came down, I could feel the blood start to come. I could feel it like blood level dropping, like I was knew that I was gonna faint. And, and so I have a history in my life of not fainting a lot, but I'll faint if I give blood. So I know the sensation and I knew what was coming. And so I was maybe, maybe well, I wanna say 30 yards from the door to the building so I quickly began to move uh, rapidly to the door, hoping that I could get inside and then just sit down because inside the lobby there they had some benches and I just wanted to park on a bench to try to catch myself, right? 
And so I could feel the blood dropping. I walked, I got through the, the second set of double doors. And at that point I lost consciousness and just ate it, right? And so I, I, I believe it would have been quite a sight. And I was right in the middle of this lobby and it's a big, you know, sky rise type of thing, con or not, a marble floor type of scenario. And I'm there pretty much face planted on the floor. Um, <clears throat> and so an interesting happened, interesting thing happened while I was unconscious, which I'll probably do a different video on because I had a, an out of, body, out of body experience. It was pretty intense. Um, and I've thought about it a lot since then, but I came to and I was, I had my head, somebody was propped up my arm. As it turns out, there was a nurse that had worked in the building. So she was just coming in. So, you know, I, I got very lucky. The, the timing and the place of where my incident happened could not have been any better at all. It was uh, in a high rise building. It was at an hour of the day where there was people flooding in. So there was a lot of people there <laughs> ready to help me. Um, you know, that 911 was called really quickly. The paramedics arrived fast. I didn't feel any pain until I came out of, until I was awoken, right? So I remember uh, coming out of this unconscious state and I found my head rested on some person's arm and that's when I felt a pretty sharp pain in my chest. And I really didn't have any clue at all what was going on other than I couldn't, I could breathe, but the breathing hurt. I could move and the movement hurt. Um, I, I had my senses about me. I could answer the basic questions of who I was, the day of the month, who the president was, and all of those types of things. But the physical pain was there and it was definitely, it was incapacitating, but also people were not letting me move. So I wasn't able to really test how incapacitated I might have been, but I was in no state to want to move. So I was, uh, the, the Ambulance arrived. They did a great job of carrying me, you know, putting me into the van. The van ride went very quickly. Uh, you know, the ambulance ride, and I ended up in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for I want to say two weeks, and uh, and I think probably like a, a lot of people who've ended up in the emergency room under certain certain cir certain circumstances, whether it's a heart attack or a stroke or something. Um, I distinctly recall being in an emergency room, looking at a lot of health medical medical staff looking at me as if I might die, right? And I will tell you that is a feeling that um, I will never forget, you know, because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty memorable, right? So you know, having a lot of people look at you like you're in trouble. So I remember that. And then I also remember there's a couple of different things that they could do procedurally with you at that point related to try to, you know, a physical intervention where they want to try to get in and, and, and take a physical stab at that blood clot or whether they just want to give you some medication to see what that's going to do. And in my particular situation, I had what they call a double saddle blood clot where so both pass so blo both blood passages into my lungs were obstructed and that's what that's what caused me to lose consciousness. And they said afterwards, the doctor was explaining how remarkable the human body is because um, it's designed to when blood stops getting to your brain, your body falls down so that blood can then flow equally to all parts of your body. And I thought, oh, that's genius, right? Uh, and that's essentially what happened I fell down. Um, but so in my case, they chose not to do a physical intervention to try to get to the clot. They put some medication in there. They did, I do recall them giving me a choice, but honestly, because I remember that I had to sign something, and I remember it was just my dad there at the time, and and I told him I understand what I'm signing here. I'm I'm making a decision to go this way rather than that way, and that's what they were really looking for. Um, and so, yeah, once they decided to just medicate me, then it was a matter of. Um, taking me, they put me through some kind of machine that's one of those uh, cylinder shaped units that you, <laughs> they move you into and it scans you all around. I don't know if it was an MRI or some big machine. And I'll tell you the pain, if there was pain associated with the pulmonary embolism, it peaked there. And I don't know why. I don't think it was because I was in the machine, but I was being moved around a good bit and jostled. And I think I had to actually play a part in like pushing myself. There was no way that the people who were there could move my body from one, one uh, from the bed to the other side. And so there was a, a, a extreme amount of pain there, but it was 
fairly temporary and then once that part of it was over I was just uh, I was placed in some, some kind of intensive care unit I think I stayed there for four or five days so that I think that apparently that was normal I was in a pretty weakened state uh, and I remained in the hospital for I think 12 days total which seemed like forever to me and I was just very anxious to get out the staff at the hospital were great I was incredibly fortunate um, I, I also gained an appreciation for folks that didn't have it as good as me because I at one point I was sharing a hospital room with some others so I got to see two or three other people cycle through the other side of the room and their their condition both their health and just where they were in, in their life and their their uh, lack of insurance coverage I heard all the stories because there's just a piece a sheet of you know fabric separating you and I felt very lucky to have been to have the insurance coverage that I had um, and to be on a road to recovery where some of these people had physical conditions that were just, yeah, I felt really bad for them. So that's why I'm on Xeralto. Um, you know, at the time the doctor gave me the choice of Eliquis, Xeralto, they didn't really bias my decision making one way or the other. It came down to me that I'm, as I mentioned in my other video, I'm lazy. And so Xeralto requires one administration a day. I take a pill. Uh, whereas Eliquis required two, and that was it. It was it was a pretty numbers-based decision-making process for me. Uh, so that's it, right? So if you have a, if you have any pain in the back of your calf, right, or you have swelling, uh, make sure that you have that looked at. That you see a medical professional right away. And I would say if you have swelling in your calf, and they they do some initial scanning and they don't find anything get it done again so um, you know I had a little bit of heartburn about the fact that I got scanned and they didn't find it it's hard to fault people if they're not reading what is you know what a signal is signaling um, but I clearly had a blood clot that the technology missed and it led to me having a pulmonary embolism that put me down and could have killed me and, and does kill some people um, so always get a second opinion you know um, early on I should have been paying attention to what my body was telling me, right? I was fatigued. I could feel, I had this sensation in my lips as I noticed. It's very hard to describe, but, you know, I knew something was up and I, I didn't take action as quickly as I should have. So I let it get to the point where I collapsed and had an emergency event, right? Which you don't want to have. Um, and, you know, and I would say f for those of you who are, who've had it recently, it, it, yeah, Xeralto works great. My life, I have not had any more events. I don't. I haven't had any DVT since then. Um, you know, it, it, it can it can get better. Uh, for those of you who have who have family that have been through this, um, you know, it's not it's it's grim. And I joke with my wife, but you know, if I had died that morning, it would have been quite all right because there was zero pain. Like when I hit the ground. Um, I was, yeah, there was no pain associated with it. If my heart had stopped beating, um, I would have just faded onto it. I had, and I did, I had, a, I had an out-of-body experience while I was there unconscious, which was its own unique story, which I'll probably tell in another video. But uh, it was pretty peaceful, right? The pain wasn't until I was in the hospital uh, coming back, trying, you know, they're trying to fix me up. That's where things started to hurt. And even then, it wasn't the worst in the world. But, uh, you know, if, you, if you're going through this, good luck. You know, uh, my thoughts are with you. I, I hope for the best. If you have any questions, you have your own story. I'd love to hear it down in the comments. As always, take care of yourself. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.